Last summer, I had the chance to drive a real race car at a real race track. And let me tell you, shit's hard. Even after a childhood of racing games and Sundays spent on the couch, I couldn't get it to go past 80. And while it was exhilarating for me, that's about what these cars are supposed to pace at. Safe to say I'll stick to the video games, and while they themselves require their own skill sets, there's one major difference. Anyone can do it, from the greenest novice to the hardest veteran. And don't get me wrong, I've taken part in some great races, but most of the time... I, 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 I Caution is up. Needless to say, there's a reason they leave the real racing to the professionals. Because even when they falter, they hold a prettier wheel than most. An ability that's granted them access to the fastest machines on the planet for one of the most prestigious motorsports in the world. Most of the time. As godlike as they might seem, race car drivers are still human. They make goofs and gaffes and screw-ups and fuck-ups just like anybody else. And the consequences vary in severity. Sometimes they're unnoticeable. Sometimes they completely alter the outcome. And sometimes they're just straight up detrimental. But in one particular case, on a sunny Daytona day, it wasn't just one or two drivers creating problems. It was the entire field who came together to create a race so bad that for the first time in over four decades, it was reformed from the ground up. This is the mother of all wreck fests, the ultimate sport ender, the crash that ended the clash. By 1978, race cars had gotten pretty fast, and nowhere was that more evident than in Talladega qualifying. High 180s, low 190s, high 190s, the pace was picking up. But people didn't seem to care, and why should they? This isn't the main show, so why should they watch? Asking that very same question was Monty Roberts, brand manager of the poll sponsor Bush Beer, who had an idea that would shed a spotlight on Saturdays. An exhibition race, a 20-lap sprint sandwiched between the season opener at Riverside and the eventual season opener at Daytona. And the kicker? It would only feature the poll winners from the previous season. Billed as the fastest race of the year, I give to you the Bush Clash. On paper, it sounded pretty awesome. I mean, it's a who's who of the fastest cars in the sport. Who wouldn't like that? In practice, eh. Don't get me wrong, this race has had some great moments, but the smaller field size made them few and far in between, with the 1981 race fielding only seven cars. As time went on, however, the field would grow, and while restrictor plates made the racing more competitive, it was still relatively tame compared to its regular season counterparts. Which leads me to my next point. Teams can only bring so many cars to Daytona, and with the Great American Race just around the corner, why would you ding up a perfectly good car for a scrimmage? It just doesn't make any sense. So where you would expect to see death-defying dive bombs, most vouch to stay in line and play it safe, often leading to some pretty big snooze fest. If Speed Weeks was a bag of starbursts, then the clash was lemon-flavored, and it wasn't gonna get much better. In 1991, they included a halftime break where they would invert the field for the final 10 laps. Then in 1998, they swapped out Bush for Budweiser and featured a 25-lap qualifier followed by the 25-lap race. In 2001, they turned the whole thing on its head, extending it to 70 laps, and in 2003, they broke it into two segments, 120 and 150. In 2009, they added five laps to the race, because why not? And by 2013, it was completely unrecognizable. Now called the Sprint Unlimited, fans had the power to vote on the race format, pit stop requirements, the fire suit on Miss Sprint Cup, and whether or not cars got eliminated from the race. This is all great. Maybe a little much? Thankfully, come 2016, they dial things back to brass tacks, though now including past Clash winners, 500 winners, Daytona pole winners, and playoff drivers. Which leads us to the format we have today, February 9th, 2020. Today, fans are settling in for another full, uninterrupted, totally predictable season of Cup Series racing, now featuring a new title sponsor, or should I say four new title sponsors, Xfinity, Geico, Coca-Cola, and our good old pals at Bush Beer. For the past four years, they've sifted back into the sport through their sponsorship with Kevin Harvick, and now they're not just sponsoring the series, but the race as well. Which means that for the first time in 22 years, the Bush Clash is back. But after last year's off and on weather delays and Jimmy Johnson channeling his inner chick Hicks, fans are hoping for clear skies and cleaner racing, only one of which they're gonna get. For the opening 65 laps, however, things are as calm as could be. So clean that one of the actual highlights is Hamlin gets out of line. May seem ridiculous, but with the amount of chugga chugga choo chewing these guys were doing, it was a miracle anyone tried anything at all. And there was another highlight. At lap 47, the Toyotas made their final green flag stops, taking a quick and risky gas and go. But the 20 of Eric Jones didn't want to take that risk, so he came up with an impromptu strategy. I don't think that's gonna make it. <laughs> he was forced to give up a ton of time, shuffling back as the only car a lap down. And in a race this short with a field this small, you don't come back from that. For all intents and purposes, his race was over. Fast forward to 10 to go, and the field has unanimously decided that it's go time, forming into a three-wide dogfight for the lead. Leading them is Joey Logano, who's become notorious for making some of the riskiest blocks ever pulled. And approaching from the rear is Kyle Busch, who never lifts for anyone. 
Yeah, this goes about as well as you'd expect. Oh, oh we got oh. Jump that up. And Sorry, Jane. Oh, oh Kyle Busch almost oh. saved it. He collects Logano, and he's in the wall with Keslowski. What did you think there, uh, spotters? Look like Joey blocked us six different times in one move. Keselowski might not have been happy, but Eric Jones was delighted as he got his lap back and a couple of spots to boot. But he still had the whole field in front of him, and with just three laps to go, he'd have to do some serious damage on the next restart. Oh! Ryan Newman came down, and everybody behind piles up! That's not what I meant. To this day, it isn't really known if there was oil on the track, but either way, Newman and Byron found themselves in a synchronized dance with their rear tires, causing a big old pileup and a log jam on the top lane which accordioned all the way back to Eric Jones, putting him back on pit road at the mercy of his crew. All right, guys, we've played this out long enough. We've already gone over the scheduled distance. Please just make it around two more laps, and go! <laughs> of course, Goodyear had to make their own contribution to the wreck fest, leading to another big pileup that collected even more cars, including who else but Eric Jones. And because the racing god's cruelty has no bounds, they made sure to include Jimmy Johnson, just for good measure. And in Shades of 1981, this leaves just seven cars to fight it out, one of whom is two laps down. Please, guys, this isn't even the main event. You have bigger fish to fry. I don't care if we finish under green, just make it to the white flag, please. All right, clean so far. Hold it steady. Oh, no, 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 fuck, shit. Goodness gracious. For Eric Jones, this is hell. Groundhog Day. Another wreck in a race that was supposed to end nine laps ago. And now his car looks like a bulldozer, sounds like a lawnmower, and the hood is blowing up like a balloon, held together by nothing more than tape. Even with just four competitors remaining, any mechanic, physicist, or human with eyes will tell you, that car can't win. He may as well just take it to the garage, but for the fourth time today, his crew pulls off a miracle, putting him back on track with one of the most iconic repair jobs of all time. At this point, it's been almost an hour since the race was supposed to end, and if anyone else wrecks, it could mean the field. Not since 2002 have we seen calamity on this scale, and the last thing NASCAR needs is a repeat of the 1960s. They know they have to keep it clean, but at this point, all they see is black and white. They've been beaten, battered, torn, shattered. They want nothing more than the checkered flag. Enjoy. Tremendous push from Clint Boyer to get Austin Dillon out front cleanly. Now he's got control. Now, now all he has to do is watch what kind of run comes from behind. Can he go, Ryan Newman? Do something. Oh, yes! 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 Oh shit, Eric uh, Jones! What the fuck? <laughs> if Tristan misses oh this. Holy Look at the shit. Hood. Yes! Oh my god! If they take the white flag under green, oh please, then the next flag will end the race. Three wide! Look at the speed Jones has with that car all bent up, and it's Newman at the white flag! Holy shit! He got to block him! This is the best racing to see cars. <laughs> Holy shit, I wish Eric Jones would have won. Oh my god. Oh my god, oh, man, it's over. They're gonna <laughs> take the book. There they go. Do you want to lead here or do you want to be second? Well, all day long, I I, I didn't want to be in the field. <laughs> oh, my oh my god. 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 Jones with the most damaged car in the race. He's in the front. Wow. <laughs> wow. They're gonna fucking win. <laughs> Eric Jones is going to win the Bush Clash with a car that's ready for the dumpster. And that was it. The car that belonged in the compactor somehow found its way to victory lane, and not a single driver left the track without blood on their hands. Every single car, including the untouched number three, found themselves in at least one accident. And as for Eric Jones, he wound up in three of the four, in addition to his cha-cha slide on lap 47. All in all, the damages from this race totaled at least $3 million, and that was just for the cars in the garage. There is no telling how much it actually cost the teams to run this race, and not even a month later, NASCAR would respond. In 2021, they'd be moving it to the road course, and then in 22, across the country to LA, burying a 41-year tradition in ruin and disgrace. There's been a lot of talk as of late about driver etiquette, the checkered flag used to inspire an appetite, one that you always wished to satisfy but wouldn't wallow in the disappointment of coming up short. These days, however, it's become a craving, 
And when the chips are down, these civilized drivers, they eat each other. Bump and runs, dump and runs, annihilate and runs. It's become the norm, and most of them happen at the newer tracks. The first turns of Coda and Indy, the Bristol Dirt, the reconfigured Atlanta. Hell, even St. Louis saw some pretty nutty stuff, and I'd be willing to bet that Wilkesboro and Chi-Town could be in for the same. But as always, most of NASCAR's promo material is concentrated into just two places, Talladega and Daytona. And to me, that's where it starts, on an unassuming day in an unassuming race, with what are supposed to be 18 of the best stock car drivers in the world needing 13 extra laps just to finish it out. We all want the thrill of victory, but when it's right there in front of us, we might fail to ask ourselves, what are we willing to do for it? Are we willing to risk ourselves, others, our credibility, our reputation? Probably not questions one would ask while traveling at 180 miles an hour, but still, maybe they should. Because on that day in Daytona, they gave their answers. And they continue to ring true over three years later. One car around Austin Dillon. Well, more than one car around. Eggs in around, several cars around in the back. Then Dillon the out. yellow Dillon. is out. I told you, no whammies. Around right. goes Truex. Oh, another see. spinner. Got another one around. Oh, Christopher Bell, all torn up. Kimi hey. Raikkonen okay. caught up in it. Oh, no. So oh, hey. no. Uh oh. There goes McDowell. Another one around. Yep. <laughs> and the caution is out. For what? Well, that was ugly. 